everyone, my name is Mike Slider. I work at WP Engine. Uh, WP Engine is the premier WordPress hosting provider, or at least that's what our marketing literature says. Um, but no, we, we do a pretty good job of it, and we're doing a lot of cool things, scaling in the cloud and using things like Kubernetes and whatnot. If that sounds interesting to you, please come up and talk to me. Let me know, because we're hiring. So this, uh, this is called Performance Testing with Python and Locust, AKA snakes and bugs eat your website. Um, by the way, I put examples up here at this uh, GitHub, uh, my GitHub, because uh, I know that some of the slides and things are hard to see here. So uh, this is the outline, very simple. So let's start with why. Why do performance testing in the first place? So there's a sort of simple, obvious answer, which is that people just aren't going to put up with slow stuff these days. Uh, as this quote demonstrates, after like three seconds, they're going to start leaving your site. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to do performance testing, right? You can always throw your stuff out into production, uh, hope everything goes okay, and if it doesn't, you know, then ad hoc solve your problems. So there's another reason that I'll, I can give you uh, an example for uh, that happened with us. Uh, WP Engine spent a lot of time uh, developing a back-end storage solution for our enterprise customers. And initially, when we were going down this path, we did do some performance analysis and performance testing, but we found, um, but because we didn't have a very robust and like, uh, uh, structured performance testing uh, environment or tools. Uh, there was a lot of room for human error, and we thought we were within uh, tolerances, but we hadn't really compared apples to apples. And we were comparing apples to oranges, so um, we thought we were okay, but when we went to production, this happened. So <laughs> that, that thing sticking up there is the bad part. It, Performance already wasn't great. It was like 2,000 milliseconds for this particular customer. Um, we call this the beaut of despair. Um, so we wasted a lot of time and, and, and money on this. Uh, and so having a better performance tool has given us better repeatability and better predictability, which has been a great benefit to us. So that's the why. Uh, let's make sure we agree on what performance testing is. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Basically, you're measuring these things. Um, for most people, and for us, I would imagine that response time is the critical factor, uh, latency, because there's not really any point in scaling if no one's using your stuff because it's already too slow. So uh, there's a lot of different types of performance tests and names, things like pipe clean, stress, load, soak, uh, whatever. I'm not gonna go into detail on that. Instead, I'd like you to direct you to this book um, by Ian Molyneux. If you're serious about performance testing and it's something you want to do seriously, I highly recommend checking it out. It does like a very detailed, formal treatment of performance testing. Okay, so how do we do performance testing? This is where I talk about Locus. So uh, just a couple of things about it. It's open source, MIT license. They have docs at locus.io, and it does support Python 3.6, which is very nice. So let's do a very brief demo. I have a, a sample app here. Um, can you see this? Is that readable? Okay, cool. Um, so I have a sample app. Uh, it's Flasker. It comes bundled with the Flask micro framework. Um, and it's just a very simple sort of micro blogging thing. You can just, you know, there's a few things there already, but you can just put stuff in there and hit share and it gets added to that list. And, um, oh look, as you can see, it looks like Russian hackers have already started using our service. So we gotta make sure it'll scale before the next election so that uh, all the Russian bots, you know, we can handle that traffic. So let's do a simple uh, performance test on that. So here's the very simplest type of performance test you can do uh, with Locust. So, you have two things. You have a task set, basically you're extending task set, and you're also extending HTTP Locust. So the HTTP Locust class models a real life user, so, so someone who's gonna be clicking around on your website. The task set is the set of things they're gonna be clicking around on. So 
the task um, uh, decorator here is what identifies the task. And then inside of it, you'll notice this client that's provided by the uh, superclass. And it's basically a very thin wrapper on top of requests. So if you're familiar with requests, this will be very straightforward for you. So we're just saying we're going to get slash, which is the root of our web app. So what happens when that runs? Let's run that. So uh, going to be. So here you can see uh, you give you give it dash f with the file, and then this is the target website, which is where I'm running Flask. So let's run that. Whoops. Let's go to. Um, let's try it. Okay. What that does is provide a web interface for you running on port 889. We're going to just send five users, uh, launching two of them per second at this site and see what happens. Um, so nothing is happening because I think I screwed something up here. There we go. So here you can see. Um, this is saying we're, this, these are the locus requests that are happening. This gets updated in real time. There's some cool charts that this thing provides in the latest version. And something to note is that you can download these CSV files. This one, for example, is the same as the previous page except in CSV format. And then this one is nice. It gives you a response time distribution, which is basically saying, uh, the number of requests per uh, percentile. So, for example, the way to read this is if I've lined these up right, I don't know, like 95% uh, of the requests take eight milliseconds or less. And this is in CSV format. So it's great for importing into other things. So that's what Locus sort of provides out of the box. Let's do something more, slightly more complicated. Um, so we're going to do another example. This one's a little more complicated. So the first thing is... There's an on start method. Locus will call that before it does anything else. So it's good if you need to, for in this particular case, log into something for your test to make sense. Um, the other thing I've added is a, another task that hits an entry endpoint that I provided that just gives you one of those little microblog posts based on its ID. So let's run that and see what that looks like. Okay. Again, I'm just, I don't know, let's do more, let's do more people. Now we're going to do 50 users. Okay, so you can see that it's running. It's, uh, it's logging in and it's hitting slash again. Notice that for entry, um, what it's using as the name of that particular field is provided right here, where it says name equal entry. If I didn't have that, it would do a different row for like entry slash one, entry slash two, entry slash three, and you probably don't want that. So this actually provides a way to group your requests together. Um, and one other thing to observe is that now you can see that we're getting a bunch of failures. Why is that happening? Well, it's happening because I created a random number from one to six, but there are only four things in the database. So this is how errors get reported which is uh, useful when you're doing your performance tests. Okay, so that's that. Let's do something a little more complicated. The next one we're gonna do is example three. So this adds a, uh, just one more thing. Um, I've created a little endpoint here in the Flasker app called slow. And all it does, it's just an artificially slow endpoint it's just going to pause for a few seconds. And it's just to give you an example of, of how, uh, how Locus is able to give you the different timings on things. So let's run that. OK. Once again, we're going to go here. And this time, I'm just going to do five again. So you see it's uh, running. It's logging in. And you can see the slow endpoint here. 
you would expect it waits about one to four seconds ish. So that looks roughly right in terms of the timing on that, um, in terms of the median uh, and max times. But notice also that some of the other endpoints are now getting really slow, like uh, entry, for example. It used to just take seven milliseconds, and now it's also really slow. So what's going on? Does anyone have an idea of why that may be happening? Would you? <clears throat> right. So the reason that's happening is that um, time.sleep blocks the current thread, but the Flask server is only single-threaded, so it blocks everything. So it's blocking all of the endpoints. So hey, we just found our first performance problem with, uh, with Locus. Pretty awesome. Let's fix it and see what it looks like. So there's a lot of different ways you could fix this. Uh, the simplest way I f I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, G-Unicorn instead of uh, the default Flask app. And with, when you use it with uh, Gvent, it's going to run it as a multi-threaded app. So let's run that. And then let's go back and restart that and hit it now and see what happens. So now we're, we logged on. And now we see what we were expecting. So slow is slow, but nothing else is slow. So hey, we just solved a performance issue. I'd like to note that you probably wouldn't have seen this just with integration or like unit tests, right? I mean, you rarely do things in combination like that when you do that sort of testing. So this is the sort of thing that you, you sort of want some performance testing to help you find. Um, okay, one final example. Uh, here we go. So a couple of new things I'm adding. Um, have you ever used an API where, like, it doesn't really abide by the HTTP spec and, like, it, it, like, you get a failed response, but that response is a 200? Has anyone ever used something like this? And they exist, right? So, um, Locus provides a way to make your own decision about whether something failed or not. Because by default, if you get a two, 200 or 20x response, that's considered success. So, this particular example shows what happens if you um, you can inspect the response by using catch response equal true here. And then I created a little API, uh, endpoint called flaky that basically half the time it returns awesome, the other half it doesn't. And then if it doesn't find that, it basically fails. So that's an example of how to deal with that situation. The other thing I'm, I'm adding here, and I didn't address this earlier, is that there's this parameter to the uh, decorator what that is is um, the frequency with which you're going to run this particular task relative to everything else. So, so for example, all these add up to 100. If you 50, 10, 10, 30, my tasks. So this task is 50 over 100, should run about half the time. This task should run about uh, 3 tenths of the time. Uh, that's, how that's, that's how that works. Um, and I should also note that the order in which things happen is, is random, basically. So flat, uh, Locus rolls a 100-sided dice and then uses that to determine which of these tasks to execute. So let's go ahead and run this one and see what it looks like. That's example four. I'm just doing five and two this time. So it's running. You can see this flaky endpoint now has some failures. If you look at what those are, uh, you see it says catch response error, got wrong response. That directly came from this. Okay. So that's enough to sort of get you started with uh, Locust. Cool. Um, a couple other notes. Uh, you, Locust is threaded, uh, so you can run a lot of threads on your workstation, but if you want to really start scaling it out, uh, you're going to need more than one machine. Uh, and you can do that with a master-slave configuration that it provides here. 
Um, you could just throw those slaves on like a bunch of different machines or something, but that wouldn't be buzzword compliant. So we actually, so we got to use Kubernetes. So this is how we do it at WP Engine now. Uh, we have a Kubernetes cluster and those, we have the locus workers out there. Um, we have a glue orchestration layer which runs the whole process and it runs the test for a while and when it's done it stores the results in BigQuery. So it installs Locust, it starts the workers, it runs for a period of time, it retrieves the results and it resides, res writes the results to BigQuery. I just want to end with a couple of tips. Uh, beware of failures. If you get any failures in your, in your tests, um, I had a case where this example I gave where it logged in, it was doing that but it wasn't it wasn't blowing up when an exception happened. So the login failed and it continued to run and that caused it to hit cached pages instead of uncached, which I was supposed to be testing. And so the results were great, but it was because the, the failures had screwed up everything up. Um, the second, this leads naturally the second thing, which is beware of caching um, because there's so many layers now. There's like memcached, uh, varnish, and file caching, all these things. You really need to, to know what, you're, what should be cached when you're doing your tests and, and what's happening to understand your results. Finally, um, when I was first starting out, like just keeping track of everything I was doing was a sort of pain in the ass. I was like, um, you know, this, I was testing this cluster with this configuration, with this scenario, and I just wrote all that down manually. That's very error prone, so adding some scripting and stuff to auto-discover what you're testing will be really great for you. And so I think the last two questions, who should do performance testing? You should. When? Hopefully, right now. <laughs> and that's all I got. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, shoot me an email or something. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions or, or if we have any other time. How much time do we have? Oh, okay. Any questions? Uh, is it possible to... Uh, you can do that so you can just basically script out in your task you can say get this then off that page we use beautiful soup to like grab a bunch of elements and you say get this one then get this one get this one so you can do things like that you can also have nested tax task sets which are sort of cool which I didn't go into because didn't have time but uh, that's that's another thing you can do. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Question? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So the question was, it doesn't, you don't have to uh, only test Python apps with the Locust. Uh, Locust by default assumes HTTP, so it wants to test any HTTP enabled thing, including, you could be REST APIs or websites or whatever. Um, but you can also add adapters to test other things that don't speak HTTP. But no, it doesn't have to be Python at, at all. Does Locust, uh, so it's simulating a user how sophisticated can you get? Oh, question is like how sophisticated can you get with your uh, user interaction on a page? Yeah, you're limited to what like requests would provide you. You can't do things like move your mouse in a circle like this, and you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you can't do things like that. Question. But do you ever run performance testing in production, or do you run it in staging? I don't know if you Ah, question is do we run performance testing in production, or do we run it in staging? So right now at WP Engine, we're, we run against these synthetic sites that we used um, to try and gauge like the performance of our clusters and, our, and where, we, where the sites are, are live, ultimately. Um, we, so we don't run that in production, but we run it in basically the same hardware configuration that would exist in production. The downside is that we don't really yet have, like there's a little bit of a uh, impedance mismatch between our synthetic sites and real live customer sites, because those can be just crazy. Yeah. Question, yes. 
One more. Have you ever used it in combination with Chaos Monkey? Oh, no. I, uh, question is, have I used it in conjunction with Chaos Monkey? I have not. Um, no. So. Cool. Thank you all.